That was a wonderful panel. Um, can we give another round of applause to our budget leaders panel for their time? Thank you for coming this morning, and it was wonderful to get this very big picture and then sort of dig down a little deeper in some of the specifics of the budget items that we're looking at in this fiscal year. And this is our opportunity to hear from the panelists, the analysts here at GBPI, who each have a very specific area of expertise and can kind of unwrap the specific information that sort of underlies a lot of the overarching information that you heard here this morning. So my name is David Schaefer. I'm the research director here at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Immediately here to my right is Laura Harker. She's our senior policy analyst overseeing uh, healthcare policy. Immediately to the left of Laura Harker is Alex Comerdell. He's senior policy analyst. He oversees our economic mobility and some of our social safety network. Immediately to Alex's left is Jennifer Lee. She's our senior policy analyst overseeing higher education. Immediately to Jen Lee's left, is our senior policy analyst, Stephen Owens, who oversees public K through 12. And immediately to Stephen's left is our policy analyst, Danny Canso, who you heard that great presentation from regarding sort of the fiscal position of the state of Georgia and how the budget is functioning inside that. I did want to give you a quick reminder as we begin. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this panel, and you will have the opportunity to submit questions through the Slido website. So to put it very simply, if you go to sli.do and you click enter event code, you would just go in there and put in Insights 2020. And if you sort of scroll down to what will now be the second panel, you'll see the analyst panel, budget panel in there. Please feel free to, res to submit questions through there and we'll have a, an, a, an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the session here today. So without further ado, I'm gonna open it up and the panelists are gonna offer you some sort of brief insights into what's going on in 2020 with regards to the budget. First up, we have Laura Harker. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, I will be talking a little bit to you about the health agencies, the three health agencies. And I know we've heard a lot about health care this year. I think in my past four or five years of looking at the health budgets, this year is pretty different as far as just some of the progress we've made in the past several years as far as trying to increase rural provider capacity, investing a lot of more money into substance abuse and mental health. Some of that progress is being reversed or slowed down this year as a result of these cuts we've seen in these budgets. Um, so I'll start with the first health agency that's the biggest, the Department of Community Health, and that's the agency that operates Medicaid. That's the health care program that ensures about 2 million Georgians, mostly children, in our state. They also manage peach care and the state health benefit plan, as well as providing um, oversight. They're not uh, included in the Department of Community Health, but the Georgia Board for Healthcare Workforce is a part of the administration for the Department of Community Health and has a lot of important functions in loan repayment rewards, um, money to medical schools to increase residency slots and capitation for medical students, so they have a big role as well. But overall, Department of Community Health was one of the agencies that was mostly exempt from the cuts, as you heard about Medicaid not being included in the cuts because it is enrollment driven. So there was some growth to Medicaid, especially for the Medicaid population that is um, it's called age blind and disabled, but as it implies elderly uh, communities as well as people with disabilities who qualify for Medicaid saw more growth. Uh, less growth was seen in peach care, there still was some, and there was a reduction as far as low income Medicaid, which is the income or the Medicaid that is based on income and mostly children are enrolled in that portion. Um, some of the increases also were related to just the changes in the federal money that comes in for Medicaid. We did see a drop in our federal matching rate and that usually happens when the average income in the state increases and so the federal government steps back and provides less money and that requires the state to put more money in. So overall, I think the biggest pieces, because Medicaid was exempt, um, the biggest concerns within this department were really around the workforce money, the Board for Healthcare Workforce. They were able to add 133 new primary care residency slots, which they've been trying to add about 100 or so in the past few years, which is good. However, most of their other components of the agency were cut. And that included some of the loan repayment rewards, some of the money to fund schools such as Mercer and Morehouse and Augusta University, those medical schools that receive grants from the state. 
to help them fund their students and to fund their graduate medical education programs. And so that was a big concern that we heard this week about how do we increase rural provider capacity with less money for these initiatives to train providers and to incentivize providers to go to communities that is harder to, uh, or to have providers to go to some communities across the state. So that was the Department of Community Health. The second largest agency is Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And this agency did see large cuts. Most, they weren't exempt from very many cuts at all, except for their Medicaid money that they do receive. And so a lot of the cuts we saw were to some of the services that have been added in the last few years. Um, our previous governor, Governor Deal, really prioritized children's mental health. And so we did see some large reductions of that money that was added recently through his commission and that work. And that was about $14 million that was reduced, uh, that newer money that was coming in. Some of those services were not yet implemented. Um, but still, I think it's important to note that we were making progress in those areas and some of those services that could have been implemented through that important work are now not able to be implemented. And for example, that included some crisis respite homes, um, four of those that were not implemented yet, as well as some supported education and employment services for students and for young workers who need supports for mental health while they're going to school and working. Um, additionally, for adult mental health, there were some significant reductions of 7.4 million in the 2021 year. Um, that included mostly, as I said, the support services, supported employment, but also some basic outpatient services. The agency really tried to prioritize crisis services, such as um, psychiatric crisis beds, but that does come at the expense of having to cut from general services where people are coming in earlier and trying to get services. Um, even though that's important, they wanna cr prioritize those crisis services. And that's great, but I think we also have to talk about how do we invest more in prevention and getting people in earlier instead of just at the crisis level. Also, there was some money for a forensic unit in Columbus. That was a, a big addition, 40 beds there. Um, and also the annualization of the comp and now waivers. And so those are waivers that provide home and community-based services to people with disabilities. In the past few years, we've been adding about 125 slots a year, but this year there were no new slots. So that's very concerning because there are waiting lists for that program uh, that are significant. I think maybe about 8,000 people now, the last I heard. So there's a lot more need for slots for that program to support people with disabilities and getting home and community-based services. So the last agency is Department of Public Health. So this usually is not very uh, much to say about this department. Unfortunately, this year, there was a lot of big changes to this department, especially related to grants to county boards of health. So public health operates um, 159 counties that have local health departments. They provide funding to those health departments. And that is really important as a front line of services for people in especially rural communities. It provides prevention screenings, cancer screenings, um, maternal health, child health services, and telehealth services even as well in all 159 counties. And so those reductions to those grants are the biggest concern that we've been hearing um, throughout the week and in the recent, uh, as soon as the budget came out really, around concerns around what that would mean for services. Um, thus far, we haven't heard what it really means for service impacts, but that is undoubtedly going to have some impact on services with those cuts. So lastly, I have to talk about healthcare waivers since that's a popular, popular topic. So um, we did have the submission of both the Medicaid 1115 waiver, which would do a limited partial expansion to about 50,000 people expected to enroll through that. And it would come with a work requirement to required you to work 80 hours a month or volunteer 80 hours a month to get coverage. And then uh, there was also the 1332 waiver which was related to the Affordable Care Act marketplace. It would have a reinsurance program component, 
which would help to reduce premiums. So that was a great part of the plan, especially in rural areas. Southwest Georgia has very high premiums, and so it would direct more money in areas with those high premiums. But the second component was concerning as far as eliminating healthcare.gov and taking that money and capping the money for the subsidies that are available for people in the marketplace. And so there's some risk with that proposal that people would not be getting those subsidies that they're eligible for. So those um, two waivers were submitted on December 23rd. Um, so there was a state comment period in December, but don't worry if you missed it or if you wanna submit more comments, we are currently in a federal comment period. So this is even more important because it's a chance for those comments to appear on federal record. And we've seen success in other states where a federal record has been used to, uh, in legal challenges, especially to work requirements. We saw that in Arkansas and Kentucky where those work requirements were blocked and those public comments were a big part of that. And so we are encouraging everyone to pick up your phone or get a pen and go to coverga.org. That is an easy place for you to submit those comments. And we have until February 7th at 11 p.m to do so, and we will be, GBPI will be submitting comments again as well. Um, the, uh, not a lot changed, unfortunately, from the previous comment period, so it'll probably look similar. Um, so that's an opportunity for you to engage on that next. Um, but as far as budget money, and concern around the waiver, there wasn't any money appropriated in the fiscal year 2021. One of the big reasons is the plans start later, so Medicaid waiver enrollment is expected to begin at the start of 2022 fiscal year. Um, there is going to be a need to add money to the 2021 budget during the amended year, which will be um, coming out next year for the Affordable Care Act waiver. The reinsurance portion starts January 1st of 2021, so that's expected to cost $104 million uh, for the calendar year. So it could be between 50 to $100 million that we would need to ask for when we amend the 2021 budget. So that's a big number to think about, too, if having the revenue needed to pay for that. And then, of course, phase two ends um, middle of 2022. So there's no money for that phase. And, oh, yes, there was the slide there. <laughs> it would appear, but reminder, coverga.org. Individuals can go there. We also have comment letter templates to help you get started. Try to um, add as many of your own stories and wording to that because they do have to be unique, um, a, a little more unique, not copy and paste, to be cop counted as an individual comment. And so there'll be two federal comment periods. This is just the Medicaid comment period. The 1332 ACA waiver comment period is expected to start next month. And so Coverage EA will also have that a portal available as well. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's it's good to be in a room with hundreds of people who care about the budget as much as we do, I think. Um, uh, again, I'm Alex, I lead our economic mobility policy portfolio at GBPI, and uh, which covers the areas of human services, also track spending, and a little bit more with my colleague Stephanie, who's in the audience, in the areas of corrections and community supervision. So I'll talk about both of those agencies uh, very briefly, uh, but first want to start with uh, the Department of Human Services, which is one of the agencies that is receiving some, um, some extreme cuts in comparison or over last year's budget. So the Department of Human Services, for those of you who are unaware, uh, oversees and protects the health and well-being of over 13,000 children and youth in foster care, as well as millions of low-income families and children in the state of Georgia who uh, access the safety net. Um, the uh, uh, DHS budget request uh, submitted by the governor, uh, or by the agency to the governor and approved by the governor, and that they'll be debating over the next few, few weeks, is, uh, get, delivers about $29 million in cuts over last year's budget. Um, the total budget for fiscal year 2021's uh, request is $800 million. And the biggest cuts in that area are seen in the area of child welfare and foster care. 
Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar uh, specifically with the difference between child welfare and foster care, child welfare is the division within the agency that investigates and monitors in, uh, cases of abuse uh, in vulnerable, among vulnerable populations all across the state of Georgia in every community uh, throughout within the state's borders. And foster care helps with the safe placement of children who are displaced from their original family. So, um, the cuts to foster care and child welfare are generated mostly by the elimination of vacant caseworker positions. And those vacant positions um, do not signal that we're saving money by simply not filling those positions. We're basically eliminating the agency's ability to grow its capacity to serve children who are cu currently in care. Uh, and and make sure that they are uh, held harmless from from other uh, issues in their communities. So, uh, just want to note that when we hear uh, folks talk about, well, these are vacant positions; they're not current positions within the agency. It's just so critical to note that anytime we cut vacancies, they were anticipated positions to be filled so that they could grow their capacity to serve more Georgians. Um, so there we have noted in the 2021 budget up to 133 vacant staff positions being eliminated in that particular area uh, that is already understaffed severely and uh, the caseload is almost overwhelming. Um, I forgot to uh, mention that I have nothing positive to say. So just, <laughs> just a heads up. Um, well, I do. It's not all doom and gloom. But... Um, Next up, I'll talk about the safety net uh, portion of the budget that uh, DHS oversees. So uh, the Department of Human Services and specifically the Division for Family and Child Ser Children Services uh, administers most, if not most, of the state's uh, federal public assistance programs. So that includes programs like SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, most of you are, are familiar with it being called food stamps, uh, perhaps. Uh, temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF and uh, Medicaid. Um, that area is seeing cuts in the, in the uh, range of about $6 million. And again, most of those cuts are generated from the elimination of additional caseworker positions. Um, another area within the agency that is extremely understaffed, uh, where the caseload is uh, extremely high. Um, We've done a lot over the last few years to reform this particular uh, division within the agency, including the creation of a new integrated eligibility system called Georgia Gateway. Georgia Gateway is essentially a portal that uh, folks can access on their own to uh, apply for benefits and submit uh, documentation to, to recertify and, and stay on the program. Um, and this week in the joint budget hearings, the director for DFACS, uh, when asked how are we going to uh, make sure that families are still accessing benefits with, this, uh, with these cuts, knowing that the staff is already limited, he reassured that the uh, agency has been working uh, around the clock to improve the online gateway system so that we don't need as much uh, hands-on uh, assistance with helping folks get access benefits. Um, but also in the same breath uh, mentioned that that funding for that particular system, Georgia Gateway, is being cut by $5 million in this budget request. So lastly, I want to mention uh, something that's happening in our state that needs to be addressed uh, pertaining to temporary assistance for needy families. When you examine the state budget, you will see all throughout, especially within the Department of Human Services, transfers for temporary assistance for needy families. And for those who are unaware, temporary assistance for needy families, and I've said it about five times now, so I'll call it TANF, is a federal block grant program in the amount of $330 million that is delivered to Georgia, specifically for the purposes of reaching and serving Georgia's poorest families, children and families. Um, since 1996, which is whenever the welfare reform uh, was, ch welfare was changed as we knew it, and the law went into effect and TANF was created, our caseload has dropped dramatically and we have shifted the majority of our TANF funds over to child welfare. In fact, 70% of our budget for TANF in the fiscal year 2021, if this budget's approved, will actually go to fund and plug holes in child welfare versus 30%, which is, uh, which is left over to serve our neediest families. Um, so uh, here we have about $3.9 million in transfers of TANF to go fill, fill holes 
in uh, child welfare, uh, just emphasizing we don't need holes in child welfare. We need adequate revenues to fund that system, especially whenever the leadership is discussing reform for that particular area. Um, TANF is not, TANF's core purposes are not to fund child welfare. That is an obligation of the state. And Georgia is an extreme, an emphasis on extreme outlier in terms of states that are not paying their fair share to run an effective child welfare and foster care system. Um, so that's my, my soapbox on that. Uh, very briefly, uh, we mentioned earlier that corrections is, is facing some significant cuts. Uh, we're, uh, corrections is uh, anticipating a potential $54 million cut in fiscal year 2021. And again, most of those cuts are generated from additional uh, staff, staff cuts, uh, vacant positions, as well as limiting part-time staff uh, corrections uh, workforce is mostly correctional officers. So these are the folks who are working directly in the prisons and engaging with folks who are uh, currently incarcerated on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, over the last seven years, seven or eight years, uh, particularly throughout Nathan Deal's administration, we've seen a huge shift in our criminal justice system. Uh, we've been on the map for almost a decade on criminal justice reform. Um, while it's been notable, you know, there's still so much work to do, but just want to note here that most of the reforms have been in the areas of reentry and health for people who are incarcerated. In fact, the budget for the Department of Corrections has grown by 15% over that reform period, but most of the growth in that budget has gone to health and services for uh, people who are incarcerated and on the reentry side. So when we see cuts, particularly to programs like the GED opportunities for currently incarcerated individuals, it says nothing to us other than we are experiencing a reversal in the reform of our criminal justice system and in corrections. And, um, that's that on that. One of the positive uh, signs that we're seeing in, in the uh, corrections budget was an increase, and the only increase that I can note for you all today for the Metro Reentry Facility, which is an old facility. It was created a very long time ago, but it was remissioned uh, about almost a decade ago to focus almost exclusively on reentry services in the areas of health, education, uh, mental health services, uh, workforce development and training. And that's uh, primarily to serve individuals in the metro Atlanta area. Um, so that is uh, my, my spiel on human services and corrections and now I'll pass it over to my colleague Jennifer to talk about higher ed. Thanks Alex. Um, my name is Jennifer Lee, and I am a policy analyst here, and I focus on higher education. I will give a brief overview on higher education, but if you want to learn more, I encourage you to join me in my concurrent session after this in the Blue Room. We'll, we'll dive more into higher ed. Um, so as you heard this morning, one of the planks of our people-powered prosperity agenda is a strong workforce in the state of Georgia. And how we support our higher education system is a really important part of that workforce plank of our people-powered prosperity agenda. The way that uh, the state supports higher education in Georgia is mainly through three agencies. We have the University System of Georgia, um, which you're all familiar with, our system of public colleges and universities throughout the state. Um, our technical college system of Georgia, um, also extremely important. And then the Georgia Student Finance Commission, which is the state agency that administers our HOPE programs, our HOPE scholarships and grants, and also administers the state-funded dual enrollment program, which there has been a lot of um, um, activity around this legislative session already. So in higher education this year, um, it is mostly status quo for most of the budget. Um, the, enroll, the formula funded portions of the budget were shielded from the budget cuts. And so the large majority of both the Board of Regents and Technical College System of Georgia budgets are driven by formula funding. And so there were small increases related to that. In USG, we saw $78 million related to formula increases in formula funding and $3.5 million for the Technical College System of Georgia, which are essentially flat when we look at sort of the larger budget picture and population and enrollment growth throughout the state. 
The budget also did include um, an amount for pay raises for full-time employees earning $40,000 or less who work for both of those systems. Um, there was $3.6 million in the USG system and $1.5 million for the TCSG system. Our colleges and universities do employ a lot of staff who work under that um, income threshold. And where all of the cuts happened were actually in these programs that are under the Board of Regents and Technical College System of Georgia, but not in instructional funding. So for in USG, they're referred to as the B budgets. So for the Board of Regents, there are a number of, 90% of the Board of Regents budget is related to the teaching program, general instructional funding to our colleges and universities. But there are a number of very important um, public service and research related programs under the Board of Regents, and all of the cuts came um, from those programs. Um, those are things like our public libraries, um, our agricultural uh, co op extension services, Georgia Tech Research Institute. All of those programs are under the Board of Regents and saw um, $14 million in the amended budget, which we're currently in, and $16 million. Uh, for, for the next fiscal year budget, 6% cuts overall in those, in those areas. On the technical college side, those programs include adult education, cuts um, to adult education, which provides services to adult learners in Georgia without a high school diploma, so all of our GED services. Um, and also our, um, there's some quick start and some specialized economic development and um, workforce development services um, under the Technical College System of Georgia. Um, so all of the cuts were under those specialized programs and several of those, um, as you mentioned, especially in University System of Georgia are particularly important to rural areas in the state having to do with uh, um, co-op extension, agricultural research, um, the vet research and experiment state, veterinary medicine research and extension um, research uh, are all under, uh, under the Board of Regents there. For the Georgia Student Finance Commission, um, lottery funds also are not affected by budget cuts and they are, um, but there was no increase in HOPE awards this year as there has been for the last several years. We've seen about 3% award increase in the HOPE awards amount. This year, there was no HOPE awards increase. Um, the Georgia Student Finance Commission also administers several state-funded scholarship um, and post-secondary access programs. Dual enrollment was flat this year at a budget of $100.8 million. And I want to note that that appropriation of $100 million um, assumes that provisions passed recently by the Senate and House Bill 444 will pass. In the budget request that came um, last year, um, assuming that no changes were made, the budget request was actually for $123 million. So it is essentially a cut even though the appropriation is flat. Um, and then the REACH, state-funded REACH scholarship program uh, that is popular throughout the state is also flat funding at $5.4 million. The last thing that I'll mention, and this is sort of the hill that I <laughs> like to tie on, is our lottery reserves, which is hidden sort of in the budget and in our uh, revenues and reserves report. Um, not, most people don't know that every year the state um, over budgets or perhaps underspends lottery <laughs> funds, however you want to look at it every year. And all of those surplus funds at the end of the year go into a reserves account. Um, our reserves account of unspent lottery funds, which voters approved to be spent for education, now stands at nearly $1.3 billion that has amassed over time. About 572 million of that is required by law, so we are well over the legal requirements that we have there um, in a shortfall reserve that is there to make sure that we can um, fulfill our promise to Georgia students. Um, it is sitting, the state treasury manages it, it earns interest, that interest is funneled back into the lottery reserves, um, and that's something that is not very apparent in the budget, but it's just something that I like to note. Um, it is an, another significant reserves account that we have separate for lottery, separate from our state revenue reserve fund. Um, so that um, our lottery reserves continue to grow. Um, as far as I know, there's no plan associated with that. Um, but in all in all, the the main part that I do look at has to do with the institutional funding, and all of that is is flat. In some ways, 
no news is good news from my perspective on higher education. What we've seen in the past is that higher education has been particularly vulnerable to um, budget cuts during times of recession. Um, so the fact that we are remaining flat is in, is in some ways a good thing, but that is the institutional funding for sure is the first uh, thing that I look at because it's so connected to both the quality of education we have in our colleges and the affordability for our students. Um, and with that, I will turn it to Stephen. Thank you very much. So if you're wondering, as you hear about all these cuts, uh, where is all this money going? Then boy, do I have a presentation for you. Um, because I, I oversee our K through 12 education portfolio. Um, and as you heard, the teacher pay raises um, have commanded a significant amount of these increases to the budget year over year. And so we'll, we'll hit some of the top line edits as we look at the 2021 budget and then talk about kind of what a few of those areas that we still need to focus on as we move forward. So all in all from last year, the DOE funding, which the vast majority of that goes down to local public schools, increased 2.6%. $270 million, and that's driven by $362 million for the teacher pay raises, as well as $144 million for enrollment growth. And I'm going to talk about each of those separately, just kind of what that looks like in the overall budget. But if you're wondering how these numbers add up, how we can add $362 million, but only $272 million total, it's because uh, we've had a few uh, savings that Right, might just be a one-year deal, maybe this will continue, but we can't really uh, budget on increased reductions to local five mil share. So when people wrote the Quality Basic Education Act, which is the way that we fund public schools in the state of Georgia, they wanted to make sure that local districts were compelled to raise a certain tax so that it's actually your local public school. So that local, the property taxes is coming out of your, uh, your home um, those have increased this year to the tune of $151 million last year. So that's less money that the state then sends down to local districts because that local money is taking up a larger share of the local budget. So this means the average home price in Georgia and the average tax collection has gone up. But I want to take you down to that next point, $32 million for the equalization program. This is a progressive grant sitting on top of the Quality Basic Education Act which is meant to equalize property taxes for low wealth districts. Because you're not, you don't just have to levy five mills of local property taxes, you can add additional taxes, um, and the, the vast majority of school districts do. And if you do that, but you're not able to raise the amount of money that you need to have an adequate public education as required by the Georgia Constitution, then the state has this grant that sits on top that provides additional money to low wealth districts. So every time we add to the equalization program, it means that the distance between our high wealth districts and our low wealth districts is getting wider. So yes, the average house is worth more in the state of Georgia, but every time we add to equalization, it means that the gap between the uh, high wealth districts and low wealth districts, that we're starting to continue to see just two Georgias as far as how much they're able to levy from local taxes. Um, and then we'll have this one year kind of savings for the lower employer contribution for TRS. I'm hearing that it's gonna go back up next year. And so this is kind of a one year savings, not really a way to budget the state um, on this amount, but this helps us make uh, payroll for this year. Um, I'm gonna quickly talk about uh, some of those things that, that I've brought up. In total, in the past two years, if this budget is proposed and these additional $2,000 is added on for the teacher pay raise, that's $896 million that's been added onto the state budget in two years in order to fulfill this $5,000 teacher pay raise. Um, I, I took that to Danny and he said that it is essentially unprecedented to have that large of an addition to the state budget uh, for this. This is not a bad thing, but absolutely needs to be met with revenue as we've heard previously. I, very briefly, whenever you hear that there's enrollment growth, I think we all think that that means that we're still getting more and more kids in the K-12 program. Um, and, and that's true. We did have an increase in students this year, but it's only 0.3%. So why is the state asked to spend another $144 million on this enrollment growth? And it's because students are being in more expensive classes to educate. I want to stop here and say this is not a bad thing. 
it is a good thing to have additional resources for students in smaller class sizes, but the reason we're having such a large growth in the expense per student is because of enrollment in like early intervention for K through five, for remedial education, for six through 12. These are for students that are behind in grades. They're, they're commanded more money for those classes so they can have smaller class sizes. Um, this only goes fiscal year 2012 through 2018, but Ted Beck, the CFO of the Georgia Department of Education, mentioned uh, in a committee meeting last year that the enrollment for gifted programs has gone up 50% in the last five years. So I guess Georgia's getting more gifted. But th those are more expensive uh, programs to educate. We put more money into gifted program than any other state in the union. And so that's one of the reasons that we have additional money per student going in every time we see that kind of enrollment growth line item. And the last thing is that school districts do not see like all these different budget uh, buckets coming down of money and then just kind of put that amount of money towards that thing. If you do not have the amount of money you need to start school buses or to pay your drivers and monitors, then you have to take the money from somewhere else in your budget in order to pay for that. And so we're kind of seeing this continuing uh, stagnation of this budget for student transportation around 135 to 150 million dollars when student enrollment since 2000 has gone up 35 percent when uh, parents are starting to expect air conditioning on buses if you can believe it we are on pace to spend a billion dollars in student transportation this year in the state of Georgia and the state will cover less than 15 percent of that this is something that is becoming less of just an issue for school districts to deal with and more of a crisis as we move forward because they have to meet those needs that are given to them right there. So that is the K-12 budget, and I've been told to move to Q&A. Hey, can we give a hand to them real quick for that information? So we, we got a lot of great questions here. There's one that really kept coming up repeatedly, and it's really for all of you. And so please feel welcome to give a brief response to this. But the, the, the overarching question here is, what are the budget cuts doing to racial equity? Um, that is an excellent question. Um, and I'm really glad that it's been raised and it's something that I think we are um, asked often and it's becoming more of a, a, a pointed question for us. In fact, um, I gave a, I had a conversation with our Black Legislative Caucus this week who is becoming growingly interested in how the budgets impact in black Georgians. And I think um, when we look at who is served, uh, more likely or disproportionately served by the agencies, um, particularly those that do serve our most vulnerable uh, children and families, um, that there uh, is an outsized impact of these cuts on uh, families of color. And in particular, I'll uh, talk about the, uh, just for example, my, my gripe with the way that we treat TANF in the state, where we have um, in, intentionally designed the program to limit access to uh, cash assistance and work assistance um, in a program that who's mostly uh, reaching or mostly serves uh, women uh, who just so happen to be black women. Um, and we limit access to it so that we can then reappropriate those funds to things that do not necessarily benefit or directly serve black women. So I do think uh, that's one example. Another example would be our constant uh, decision to limit growth and in investments for affordable child care. And our public child care uh, system uh, caps child and parent, parents' uh, services. Uh, it's a subsidy administered mostly by DECAL, and it provides a scholarship to families who, uh, especially low-income working families, who need affordable child care so that they can access their jobs. They can go to work. Parents can go uh, and, and earn income. Well, in that particular area, when we had uh, gotten a small increase in funding, as, as Jennifer Owens mentioned earlier, um, in this uh, current budget request, we see that small increase in funding taken away. 
the program currently only serves about 50,000 families a, a year out of the over 300,000 likely eligible families. And 80% of the families that are currently participating are black families. So it's obviously something that's hypercritical for families of color. And when we limit growth and investments in, in those programs, then they are having an outsized impact on, on families of color. So in impeding uh, our, our progress around, particularly with racial equity. So that's my, my take. I can go on all day, but oh. Let me talk about corrections. So <laughs> real, I, I have to talk about corrections because uh, uh, the majority, over 52% of the corrections population are um, African Americans, are black Georgians. Um, so anytime that we limit uh, investments, particularly in reentry and in health, it will have an outsized impact on uh, black folks in the correctional system, in particular black men. And not to mention any disinvestment in health in the correction system also has a direct impact on the health, particularly the maternal health of, of women who are incarcerated in our system, so uh, black women in our system. So just wanted to note um, that. <laughs> any other take, opportunity wait? Missed opportunity. Save it for later. I can build off a of health while y'all. <laughs> um, so, oh, well, there's a lot that I could say about it too. I guess some of the top lines, I think just as far as uh, no Commissioner Fitzgerald from DBHDD, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, said yesterday that the safety net is stretched. And I think that really just speaks to the budget here of thinking of the front lines for services for people across the state and people of color, especially in rural communities in South Georgia, public health departments are really their main access to care. There's not a lot of hospitals or clinics available. Um, and then you also look at the workforce side, uh, schools like Morehouse School of Medicine um, and Mercer University who train a lot of providers of color and primary care providers who help to increase that cultural competency, as well as uh, providers that speak different languages as we see the need for diverse languages across workforce. Um, so I think a lot of those cuts for, to the safety net and to training diverse workforce are uh, concerning for equity. All right. Um, there was a question here regarding th K through 12 education, and it had to do with sort of the bigger conversation about uh, teachers having to increasingly use class time to address things that are not necessarily related to academics. And so the question was, are there additional funds in this current budget to support other supports for students like counseling? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and the short answer is it depends on how the district wants to use these funds. So the, uh, uh, the trend of the past 20 years in Georgia has been to increase flexibility for school districts to use money from the state how they best see fit. Um, and so districts absolutely have the freedom that if they want to use the money that was meant specifically for uh, teacher raises or kind of was allocated toward teacher raises instead towards mental health counseling or into wraparound services, they have that ability. But no, there's no one line item specifically meant for students as far as counseling is concerned. And, and that's something that we've heard a lot of as that concern um, of what it looks like for students um, in, and that are exposed to the internet constantly and what that looks like in our K-12 system. And I bring that up only because uh, when Superintendent Woods gave his presentation to the budget hearing yesterday, he talked about this insanely sad statistic that one out of every 10 students in our K-12 through public system has contemplated suicide in the last year. So that is not something that we can gloss over or just hope goes away that the more that we understand about living in today's society, um, we, we cannot talk, like, forget to talk about mental health and, uh, and make sure to prioritize that in the budget. But as far as this budget is current concerned, this proposed budget, we haven't seen it. I think we have time for one more question. And Jennifer Lee, I think this may be a question for you, but also a little bit for Stephen. And that is how many more pre-K classes could be funded by kind of dipping into the lottery reserve and what that might look like. The amount given was 500 million from the lottery reserve. Yeah, well, yeah, way to give us math up on stage. Um, so it, when it comes to individual pre-K classes, you, you end up getting into a really complex area where you talk about like kind of what are the facilities that are available right now because you get an $8,000 
kind of startup grant, but that's not going to build an additional room onto a high school in, in order to create a pre-K classroom. Um, and so you could go a long way in those startup costs, but you would need to go further than just building the additional classroom. Um, we made a change in the wake of the recession to move, instead of funding uh, one teacher for every 10 students, it was one teacher for every 11 students. And we, you know, in year 11 of the greatest ex economic expansion in the history of the United States, we have never fixed that back to one to 10. Um, and so this is something we continue to deal with. Um, and so it'll take more than just that one bump payment to be able to provide additional classrooms. It'll have to be something that we allocate for every single year. And we're going to need to put in more money for assistant teachers than $16,000. Um, because absolutely pre-K centers run a loss when they pay their teachers a living wage. Um, and so we need to make sure that they have that money from the state on the front end. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, one thing that I would just add to that is that I do think it's important to recognize that there are kind of one-time costs and then there are ongoing costs. And the lottery reserves is a, is a one-time amount that's right there. But there is something that other states have done, which is dedicate the interest and the earnings off of the reserves to an education um, purpose instead of just funneling it back in to the reserves. So I think that's a very uh, sense, um, common sense thing that Georgia could consider. Um, it wouldn't require any new funds. It would just require, um, and it, it would stay within the constitutional authority of Georgia to use lottery funds for education. Um, but it would just be looking at what are we doing with that interest? It was $26 million last year instead of putting it back into Treasury, how about we dedicate that and use that for something related to education? That's great. I'm gonna push my luck a little bit. <laughs> Danny, I got one for you here too. How do we more equitably raise revenue? Yeah, uh, well, I, I was having fun uh, just listening to, to the other analysts. And, you know, as, as someone who, uh, before having this job, worked in, in state government in, in an advisory capacity, I mean, I just wanted to note that what what GBPI does and, and what the other analysts on this stage do in providing that real nonpartisan analysis and, and working to actively bring together bipartisan solutions uh, is really unparalleled. And so, uh, you know, diving in here, I think, I think has been incredible. And especially as we go later into the afternoon and, and start to talk about some of the history and legacy behind policy, uh, I think that'll be important. But to, you know, now that we've talked about the state budget for a long time, and, and I think everyone understands, you know, the state budget is a reflection of literally almost every Everything the state does. And to understand the state budget, you also have to understand the history of our state, uh, which goes back, you know, as obvious, obviously as one of the original 13 colonies and, and all the legacy that comes with that and the civil rights movement and everything else. But today, you know, covering everything that the state does already, we rank 47th in the amount that Georgia spends per person to operate state government. And so we do the, the functions that the state of Georgia serves, you know, it, it does for less than almost any other state in America. And across the income tax, across the sales tax, across so many of, of, of the revenue raising structures that we have, you know, they're tremendously antiquated and, and the taxes that we have don't touch nearly the base that they could if, if they were simply just updated. And so, you know, Georgia does technically have a progressive, you know, graduated income tax structure, but because it's so antiquated and it, because it has so many loopholes that go unevaluated, we give away billions of dollars that could be used to, to fund core programs and, and lower the amount of taxes that middle and low income Georgians pay. And, and so we know even though the state doesn't raise nearly enough revenue, as a matter of state and local taxes, you pay a greater share of your income the less you earn every year. In, in total state and local taxes. And so, you know, the, the tobacco tax is, is low hanging fruit that, that tends to be more aggressive, but by ad adapting our tax structure with things like an EITC and making those reforms, we can ensure that every modernization we do makes the tax code more fair, still brings in more revenue and helps the state uh, to touch all these areas that, that have been covered, that are being cut, and also make those new investments. So there are so many options on the table, uh, but it starts with modernizing the state's tax code and looking at return on investment for the wide array of credits and loopholes that we have
have on the books right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so that wraps up our time for questions, but a few ways to engage us. The analysts are here in person today, could take advantage. Uh, they do have groupies, which is totally fine. So uh, you guys are going to be mad at me for that one, aren't you? Um, so they're here in person. There's also a table up here near the entrance where their cards are located. You can also find some great materials about us. Visit us at gbpi.org. Follow us on Twitter. There really is a great and steady flow of information throughout session. If you want to know what's going on, ask. Come, come visit us. We'd love to hear from you.